Good afternoon. First of all, thank you for coming here. Um, welcome to, to this side event. Uh, the title of, the, of this side event is World Tuna Cities Alliance to promote uh, the sustainability of tuna sector at a global le uh, level. The organizer of this event is Bermeo Tuna World Capital. You know something now, what is Bermeo Tuna World Capital? is an association that promotes globally sustainable management of tuna as a natural resource from scientific <coughs> knowledge and leadership of good practice. Is the result of a pu public and private uh, partnership that seeks to involve all the key players in the tuna value chain in Bermeo, the Basque Country, and internationally. We start in 2018 with 11 members, and today we are 42. Bermeo is one of the cities who has tradition and history because of the social and economic impact of the tuna and canning sector, and because it is a worldwide reference in the best sustainable fishing practice has a tuna fisher sector with 15, 50 vessels and it catch over 10% of all the tuna tropical, all the tuna tropical. We know that fishing activity is essential to ensure food for growing world population. Today, fish and fishery products are an important source of nutrients that contribute to the, a balanced and healthy diet and represent a great economic value. Among the different fish species, tuna fish stand out for their presence in all the world's oceans. Many countries rely heavily on tuna for food security and nutrition, economic development, employment, tax revenue, culture, and recreation. But with the current 5.3 million tons of annual catches, we, we will be fishing at 86% of the maximum sustainability yield. In other words, we have no margin to increase tuna fishing if we want to guarantee the exploitation of fish stocks in economic, economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable condition. This is the situation for which uh, Permeo Tuna World Cup FTN arise. Our cause, sustainability. Sustainable. Me sale fatal esa palabra. Nunca me sale bien. Tuna management. And we want to lead this movement. We know uh, that all the good resolutions need leadership. We want to share this leadership, but the goal of sustainable tuna management is not in uh, effort. Last year, in 2023, Bermeo Tuna World we do a big uh, event, was the Bermeo Tuna Forum. During this event, two big steps for the life of the Obermeo tuna and for the tuna sustainability. The International Declaration for Tuna Sustainability and the signature of the World Tuna Cities Alliance. This second point is that we are going to, 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 work, to speak today. This agreement established a framework for cooperation between cities where tuna fishing represent a substantial part of their economy, their society, and their environment. Cities that are committed to contributing to sustainable development of its territory and the tuna value chain. All this with an objective is to work together, it's very important to work together, to achieve 
to the signature in the United Nations of the Universal. We spoke about the International Universal Declaration on Sustainability. Making sustainable cities, Fortuna, under the three principles sustainability, environmental, social, and economic. I give the floor to, to Javier, and we are going to. Bienvenidos, quizás por, el, por la grabación y ahora sí por el ser también una conferencia internacional y para que la grabación quede en piezas para otras ciudades, que eso es una alianza, vamos a continuar también en, okay. en, en inglés para coger piezas y luego que sean útiles. So, welcome uh, to everyone here, uh, welcome to this Bermeo China World Capital event, and well, I will be introducing, as Ignacio was mentioning, the Tuna Cities Alliance for Sustainable Development, a global alliance, which I think that is really remarkable uh, to have I mean, uh, such an alliance of this nature, which I think is uh, one of the first you know, thematic uh, cities alliance in the world. Look, and to share with you the, the frame you know, within which this alliance has been you know, uh, signed up and, and proposed, The frame for this alliance, I think we need to bear in mind that it's a pretty uh, relevant one. And it's no other than, than a change of age that we are living, right? We are not living in an age of changes, we are really living a true change of age. And that this change of age has been defined, uh, de defined precisely because of the definition of wealth in one single dimension, which is the economical dimension. And this definition of wealth has left aside the environmental part of reality and the social part of reality. Disconnecting these dimensions from the decision-making processes of organizations, companies, uh, policy-making, well, or organizations. So this disconnection generates externalities for what we think, uh, or what we have, what, what we are really measuring about wealth. This, uh, at a model scale, uh, especially after the 40s, the, this way of defining wealth has been exponentially having its impact. Look, after the 40s, we've been living the, the great acceleration of, of uh, economy, global economy. We have grown more than ever in history, the economic growth in economical dimension and in economical metrics has been growing you know, more than ever. And this way of growing has been also having impact at the same exponential level in the environmental side and the social side. And all this comes up to define this change of age, where all this accumulation of impacts are coming up and coming back are real limits to this way of growing, to this model of growth. We are facing now environmental limits, and that's one of the main reasons that we are sitting now here talking about, you know, limits in terms of, of, of the resource that we are mentioning, to the resource, the ocean challenges, the acidification of oceans, or the climate emergency, biodiversity crisis. I mean, we all know which are the, the environmental limits of this model of growth. In the same, in the same vein, uh, the social limits of this model of growth is also coming up in terms of well, unmanageable inequalities within countries and territories, and also among countries and territories around the world. This is creating a third limit which is not so spoken of, which is the financial also limits of this model of growth. There is not, there is no stability in the environmental, so, 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 sorry, in the economic financial system. There's not enough uh, stability, there's not enough certainty. There is a lack of long-term, mid and long-term portfolios, and this is creating also limits. Yeah, in the way that the financial sector is starting to approach yeah, their investment. Financial world needs stability, needs long-term certainty. And they're starting to ask, okay, in all of their investments, requirements, they're talking, they're starting to talk about what they call ESG uh, aspects in terms of value in their investments. 
they're talking and asking to the assets about their environmental uh, impacts, they're talking about their social impact, and they're, talk they're asking for companies and, and financial assets how they're gonna govern okay, this social and environmental impact. So sustainability is also, uh, the limits of sustainability is also affecting the financial sector. All these limits are you know, creating a new environment, new challenges. And this is how the, the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs came up, okay, to come up with an agreement among uh, not only countries, but also the business sector, the financial sector, governments not only at the national level, subnational level, cities, territories, coming up to discuss over three years which are gonna be, which is gonna be the agenda, which was gonna be the agenda for the next 15 years. And that's how they came up with this, with this 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals. So this, we have an agenda to transition from a short-term oriented linear model of growth into a long-term model of sustainable development. The value of this agenda is that it comes up with trust. The companies, the business sector, the, the, the public policies, civil society, academic sector, all of them are involved to start creating the conditions to transition into the long term and create stability, uncertainty, and trust in the way that we deliver results for people. So this is the frame where this global alliance of cities, tuna cities of sustainable development has come up, is arising. And as Ignacio was mentioning, it's involving many stakeholders, not only the, the, the governments of cities, but involving industry, involving business sector, involving academic institutions, and involving civil society organizations. All these, uh, all these stakeholders are coming up to start creating this transition from the short-term linear or way that we govern territories into our long-term oriented way of how we deliver for people and for the environment and for the society, our plans and our long-term roadmaps. And so that is, a, that is the challenge that the cities that sign up for the Global Alliance of Tuna Cities for Sustainable Development assume okay, in the Bermeo Tuna Forum um, in last May. And we are gonna talk about in this session specifically about how are we starting to deliver okay, on this commitment. How, how, this, uh, how are we involving all these players in our own territories to start delivering long-term roadmaps okay, for sustainability of the sector, of the resource, of tuna, but also for people who are involved in the industry of tuna and how society and how the territory is uh, structured upon this resource, this valuable resource. So we're gonna talk about, uh, with, with this round table, a, very, a privilege of round table, we're gonna talk about the value of citizenship. How do we, how do we create a culture and a feeling of belonging right, to the territory and to the resource of tuna as a main vector to per pursue the future okay, of the territory and for the next generation. How do we live with and from this resource? That entails creating a culture, entails creating a feeling of belonging, taking care of the resource and using the resource for the long-term plans of our new generations. We're, talk, we're gonna talk also about how do we embed sustainability in industry and in the business models? How do we pursue the, how do we manage eh, the social impacts and environmental impacts within the industry of tuna industry? This is a key flagship okay, we are having here, representatives of the sector, which are main references all around the world about how, we, how do we integrate sustainability in the business models and the value and the impact that this creates for the company and for the rest of the society and the environment. We're gonna talk about also civil society role, the role of civil society, the role of public, private, multi-stakeholder partnerships that Ignacio was also mentioning. And that's gonna be pretty valuable as well. Right? How do we involve all the players into our shared long-term vision? We're gonna talk about uh, collaboration and how do we embed technologies, how do we embed shared data, how do we embed multidisciplinary visions to share long-term uh, purpose. And we're gonna talk about also the value of collaboration to attract mid and long-term investment, sustainable investment. All this ecosystem of the financial sector who needs stability in the long-term, and this stability in the long-term is gonna be created by collaboration. So, and shared, and shared visions. 
So we're going to speak all about all about these topics and items in the next session, in the next roundtable, and it's going to be a really a real privilege okay, to introduce you to our to our uh, colleagues here in the in the round table. So with your permission, I will now join the no, no, let's take a seat. First of all, we'll have the, the privilege to start uh, with, uh, with two well, main representatives of the whole uh, Bermeo Luna World Capital Alliance, the Public Private uh, Alliance and Corporation. We're going to start with, with Ignacio, who's the president of, uh, of the Bermeo Luna World Capital. Uh, Ignacio is uh, well, as I mentioned, president of the Bermeo Tuna World Capital, uh, founder of the initiative, and um, for three years he's been president of the of the, of the initiative. He's also a director of the uh, of the uh, company, family company, uh, hijos de Jose Serrat, for 24 years, fifth generation of this industry. So that is a, a key possibility itself, right? Um, this company is meant to well, be a reference in the canary, tuna canary uh, industry. Uh, it has in the DNA sustainability and innovation uh, in this family business. And their kind products maintain the history and tradition of things well done, following a careful artisan process learned and improved over five generations, as you mentioned. By training, uh, Inacio is an industrial engineer in the branch of organization. And Inacio, I'm gonna ask you, and start asking you about the how this initiative, this public-private collaboration initiative, and the Mayor Tuna World Capital, uh, has an impact okay, on the sustainable uh, management of oceans uh, in general, and specific of the tuna resource. How is the impact of this initiative that you Yes, it's, uh, this initiative is important why? Because we focus in tuna sustainability. And I am the, now I'm not the, here I was the president of the Mayor Tuna World Capital. Here I am the director of the Canary. Um, if we, what was the, 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 the most important thing that my father gave to me, the four to the five, is to, to give the, the baton, to, to give the El Testigo, the, another generation. And that is very important. If I am thinking to give the baton to, to, the, to the next, to the sixth generation, I must, when I start in 24 years ago, I, I put my what was the the, 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 the los problemas los pasamos a a castellar no 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 bueno sabes cuáles eran mi, 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 mis riesgos no los riesgos eran que desapareciera el, el bonito del norte del cual nosotros fundamentalmente vivimos si ese era el riesgo entonces no se hablaba de sostenibilidad en el año 2000 no se hablaba apenas nosotros en 2005 2007 ya vendimos pues, eh, conservas eh, con el sello MSC a Dinamarca que era bastante novedoso entonces reuniones sobre el atún ha habido muchas y en muchos sitios y en esas reuniones en esa época cuando hablaba del atún la sostenibilidad quedaba totalmente al margen no se hablaba de nada pero en mi cabeza siempre estaba que si nosotros no hacemos una buena gestión no vamos a poder dar el testigo a los siguientes. Nosotros en el Cantábrico tuvimos una, no con el atún, con la anchoa, tuvimos un, una, la, la pesquería se fue al garete, estuvo unos años sin pescar y ha vuelto a resurgir. Los pescadores apoyados, yo digo, y hay Conserva Serrat sí que hizo un trabajo importante de empujar a la, a la, al sector pesquero, que era muy bueno trabajar por la sostenibilidad. Y, y los pescadores apoyados por los gobiernos, por el gobierno vasco, fundamentalmente empujaron y se certificaron como un SCP. Y llevamos, yo no sé dónde está la madera aquí, pero llevamos unos cuantos años ya con unas buenas pesquerías de, del Bonito del Norte, que luego Julio nos hablará más de la, del atún, ¿no? Pero en el caso, y estamos respetando, yo creo que nunca se había parado la, la, la pesquería porque ya habíamos llegado a la cuota. Eso en la mentalidad de un pescador o de un cazador es bastante difícil de que lo entienda. Porque el cazador y el pescador cuando hay, coge. Y no, y no, y no piensa que va, tenemos que dejar para los demás. ¿no? Bueno, yo creo que... Sí, 
no me muevo, voy a estar toda la hora hablando. No, no, está... Es excelente entrada para, bueno, para el topic y además, bueno, es que es interesantísimo saber también el, los previos, ¿no? El histórico, ¿no? De ¿Por qué surge esta idea? ¿Por qué impulsáis centralmente esta idea? ¿Por qué eres presidente de, y fundador ¿no? de la misma? Eh, Julio. Eh, Julio Morón, eh, I'm gonna share in English for the sake of... Uh, <laughs> y luego podemos hablar en castellano como yeah, estéis yeah. más cómodos también. Julio Morón has a... A PhD in biological sciences, he started his career as an observer on board fishing vessels in the South and Central Atlantic Ocean, then worked for, um, for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, in Sri Lanka, and later for the International Employment Organization in Seychelles. Okay. He is managing director of the organization of associated producers of large-scale freezer tuna vessels, of Agac, Agac and he's also currently president of the Spanish Fisheries Confederation, EPESCA, and corresponding member of the Royal Academy of the Sea. Bienvenido, Julio, y te hago la misma, también como parte de, de los, de los eh, virtuosamente culpables, ¿no?, de, de montar esta idea de colaborativa, eh, como una iniciativa como público-privada, como el Bermeo Tuna World Capital. ¿Cómo ves decía, el impacto que puede tener eh, una iniciativa de estas características en la gestión sostenible de los océanos en general y en particular de, de los recursos pesqueros aquí. Mm, bueno, hablo en inglés por el tema de la idea. Well, uh, the creation of uh, Bermeo World Tuna Capital uh, is based on the nature of uh, the, the biology of uh, tunas, that is highly microsurfish, fish, is, is, is fish around the world. And the idea of having uh, a fleet that is based in Bermeo, that uh, actually, uh, back in the 60s, there was a big fleet of following line fishing uh, for tunas in the, in, the, in, the, in the Atlantic Ocean that drive the operations down to the, to the coast of Africa. And after, it was developed by the poor same. And the Bermeo fishermen, they were so brave that they started uh, fishing all around the world. So by the 60s, uh, they were establishing in uh, Senegal, Abidjan, in, in, uh, in Africa. Then uh, back in the 70s, uh, they moved to Ecuador, where some fleets are st still operating. And then by the 90s, mid 80s, uh, last century, they moved in the, to the Indian Ocean. In the last uh, 90s, uh, we also moved to fish in the Western Pacific, the most remote area for us. So the Bermeo uh, fleet, has been moving and is able to catch tunas, tropical tunas, following the migration of these fish in all the four major fishing grounds. So that gives an idea of why uh, are we looking for a alliance of capitals uh, uh, that live from, from, from tunas, because tuna is, as uh, you, you mentioned before, is, uh, is the main uh, fisher resources. Uh, the skipjack tuna uh, is the, the third uh, species more caught after Peruvian anchoveta and the Alaskan Pollock. So together with yellowfin tuna, you get up to 5.3 million tons of tunas caught every year. And you have uh, that, uh, those populations well managed through the different uh, regional fisheries management organizations. So we have 87% of that production is managed in a sustainable way. So all the, the different RFMOs are con controlling the, the fishing of those species and it's on the nature of the, of the fishermen. Uh, I always mention that the, 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 um, the nature of the Bermeo fishermen as driving uh, this, uh, this uh, industry to the large scale where we are now because they are, first of all, they are brave people that go out and find for the fish they try to do it in the best social conditions because this is one of the major challenges. So the, the Spanish uh, fishing sector is a large one. Uh, and, and to have a good crew, you need to pay them well. So that has been on the nature, of the core nature of, of the fundamental nature of the uh, Bermeo fishermen. And the, and the ship owners of Bermeo have been always considering the social aspect, the, the fundamental one. Then together with that, you have to work for a sustainable 
uh, environmental sustainable uh, use of their resources. So because we live on that, and we invest a lot of money on one porcine vessel. The porcine vessel costs more, more or less 30 million euros. It's going to last for 50 years. So it's going to fish a lot of tunas, but it needs to to drive the the, the fishing the fishery in, 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 in a sustainable way because we will live from the golden goose and we have to maintain it. And that's the, 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 the pillar where we f are fundamentally looking for the best practices to achieve the most sustainable uh, tuna fishing. And that's why most of the, of the, of the, of the tunas that we fish are, uh, are, are certified with Marine Stewardship Council. So we have uh, up to now, in the case of our group, 80% of our production is, is, is certified with the MSC. And the third pillar is to be economically viable. Because, uh, okay, everything could be fantastic uh, on the terms of uh, environmental uh, sustainability. Social sustainability is a fundamental part for us. We, are com we, are, we comply with the uh, INOR uh, uh, Tuna from Responsible Fisheries certification that is based on the uh, National Labor Organization Convention 188 is fishing in uh, working in fishing convention. It's a fundamental piece of the international legislation that we fully apply in our vessels to have the people well paid with the holidays, with the medical attention, with all the considerations. And this is our differential with the other actors that are competing uh, in the in this in this market because they all sell fish uh, to Europe basically and the U.S. And we have to compete with other fleets that don't follow those same standards. And they don't have social standards. They have very low environmental standards. And uh, to, for us to be economically viable, we have to value our, our, our production. So the Mayo World Tuna Capital is, is one way of achieving, collecting all those elements that we are trying to develop for, by nature in some cases, but for, for, for the long-term sustainability of our, and the, and the and the prosperity of our, of our work, and uh, and get together with other partners that actually help us in in, in driving the 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 standard for for, for achieving that uh, sustainability on the three pillars. So I think uh, getting together with uh, people like uh, our friends from Ecuador in Manta uh, and uh, other 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 cities in in, in the Philippines or. In uh, France, with Concarneau as another port, so all the cities that have been following this initiative, uh, I think it was, uh, it's a big challenge. And you were mentioning before that it's one of the first examples uh, that you yeah. a thematic-oriented uh, uh, way where you can achieve a, 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 an alliance of cities because we have tunas all around the world, so we can find very, uh, very many uh, cities actually living from the tuna, like what is doing. So. This is one of the challenges that we face, and uh, we are very proud to be part of that initiative. And I think it could it could serve as a, as a as an example for how we need to work to to, to keep living on that because we live on this. So we're the first interested in maintaining that uh, for the long run. Thank you, Julio. Yes, we'll we'll come back to that later to many yeah. of the topics that you, you touch upon because it's really interesting. You're talking about yes, the connection also between between the social and the environmental aspects, you know, and the economic ones, it's, they all come together. Reality comes together. Yeah. This connection yeah. social from economic and environment is a construction. I mean, something that reality comes together. And that's very interesting that you mentioned also the, the territorial approach and the role of industry, of course, you know. So we'll come to back la later. Julian, thank you very much. Now we will uh, welcome uh, the, um, we'll, we'll be speaking to, let's say, the industry part, and the business part, and the Initiative, uh, the, the, the public-private collaboration initiative. I will back. We'll get now to the to the governance. Okay, the, the government side, because all the players we mentioned before, all the stakeholders are involved. We need to share visions, long-term visions, and for that, you know, I really am very glad to introduce uh, to uh, persons representing uh, city, city and territory governments, and very glad to have. Sigor Uriondo, uh, representative of Bermeo. Sigor is the representative of Bermeo City Council in Bermeo Tuna World Capital. His background is uh, in the 
engineering in, in marine sector. He has a PhD in, in thermal engineering and he's associate professor in the energy department of the University of Pascal. He's specialized in energy efficiency in ships and in the last years, more specifically in the tropical tuna pursue seiners energy efficiency. He has written several scientific papers covering energy efficiency in fishing vessels and tuna pursue tuna first seiners and also digitalization of tuna first seiners systems. So, Ciro, it's a real pleasure to have you here. You're well, very welcome. And, and when it comes to governance and to governments, uh, and we, we were mentioning before, you know, one of the topics and the challenges of the, of the alliance that you have been signing up for is to create a, a feeling of belonging, of citizenship about the future of the territory. And when the future, as Julio and Ignacio were mentioning, you know, passes through uh, tuna, you know, tuna is the resource upon which you can build a, a long-term vision, best society, best economy, the whole of the territory. It's very interesting and it's critical how you create a culture of sustainability, of taking care of the resource, of using that resource in a sustainable way, understanding that the maritime part, the seaside, and the terrestrial part come together, so you need to integrate territory as a whole. All these aspects are part of a culture. How are you imposing this culture, how they're creating, and what's your experience and your, your takes on that? Okay. First, just some few, because Bermeo is mentioned a lot of times, eh? happily for me. Yep. Okay, but you must think that Bermeo is a small town, about 17,000 inhabitants, 2,400 hectares, not very big. But uh, we must think that the primary sector is more than 30% of the, of the gross added value. So and mainly, this 30%, mainly most of it is tuna. So basically, economically, it's the main sector in the town. So people has a clear implication in, in the industry. Also, you say about uh, how we can uh, involve uh, the citizens, okay? must start at think, thinking, just a curiosity, that uh, our coat of arms has a whale. And we have fishermen catching the whale. We all know what happened with whales. So, okay, you must make mistakes, and we must learn from our past mistakes. It's clear that it's a model that we cannot repeat. So, sustainability, it's a must. Especially starting from the, let's say, environment and from the resource sustainability, and of course, later we have the rest aspect of sustainability. As uh, Ignacio said in the beginning, we have uh, our local fleet. They are uh, in Permeo. They are 45 ships, 27 auxiliary ships, six cargo ships, uh, more than 20,000 jobs all around the world, more than uh, 3,000 jobs in the Basque Country, more than uh, 1,000 in the fishing, 2,000 in the transformation, and the economical impact in the Basque Country is close to 1 uh, billion euros. So, I mean, to, to show to people that economically is important is not complicated. And then we, what we must go is to show to past experience. Example of the whale is just a, a curiosity, but we have the example of the anchovy. The anchovy uh, in our town, the local town, people experience that a good management of a resource in after some time has to start generating uh, richness, I mean, economical. So it is necessary to keep the resource. And this has helped a lot to to show people. Regarding, I mean, as a town council, uh, what we have done, okay, at the beginning of the century, I mean, as uh, Ignacio said, the sustainability was something strange. Although, I think that uh, Opagak and Abad, they all were already working in a good practice codes and they published some things. There was also, also very close to our town, and when I mean very close, it's five kilometers, so people know the place because they go walking there, they see it. There is a marine research institute very involved in the sustainability that is ASTI, so it's something that people basically know. And, okay, uh, it was necessary maybe to, to, to merge all these things, the industry, uh, the canning industry, the fishing industry, and also the scientific uh, area. And then, in the 2010s, was interesting that uh, from the, uh, the private entities, and also from the town council that the need of maybe merging all of this in one association would be very interesting to promote all this. And this, I think, as far as I know, I remember is how it started the Bernal Tuna World Capital, merging all these parts. 
it starts just as an association. I mean, uh, it has been increasing partners. There are, I think, close to 50 now, nowadays. In fact, uh, the budget, I think, that is covered more by private entities than the pu public entities, just to understand that, uh, uh, that how they are taking part, because it is very important. Uh, uh, this is making a lot of activities in the town together with the town council. We have, for example, a very big uh, fish festival, let's call it. When I mean festival involves everything, I mean from industry to, to, to festivals, you know, restaurants and everything, but it's used to promote the tuna culture, or, I mean, to, 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 to learn, to, I mean, to use, uh, to, to have a good product and how to do it. And uh, we attract more than 50,000 people to the town, so it's quite important and quite popular in the area. Uh, and also there are not only local events, but also international events. Uh, and, uh, as far as I know, uh, last year there was a side event in the UN uh, uh, Ocean, Ocean Week. And also uh, last year was done the Bermeo Tuna Forum where the city's agreement was signed. Also it had an important impact in our town because we had uh, a lot of representatives from different countries. It was possible to see. I mean, with 17,000 people, people can can see. Also, that different activities uh, like uh, Innova Tuna is proposed, where we propose to the citizens and also in the universities and in the surroundings new ideas to, to, to make to reduce uh, the illegal catches and uh, the, uh, and improve the, the the condition of of the people on board. Uh, and uh, uh, we have signed also the, the sustainability, the tuna sustainability international uh, agreement, and we promote all this. From the town council also, we have one building that uh, we hope that someday it could be used, that was uh, a canning industry building that has uh, some special architecture that is considered that must be kept, and we have it there, maybe in some days when we have uh, enough, or the association has, uh, in, enough uh, financial uh, strength to, to, to make the, their uh, tuna interpretation center where all these things can be merged because at the end, to make things less abstract, we must to give it a physical structure. And this will help a lot. And uh, in this work of giving a physical structure, the tuna world capital has already prepared some premises, just a small office at the moment, and will incorporate a permanent uh, employees working with it, and this is something that people will see. And this will help us to, to, to promote all this. And from the political side, to transmit all this to the citizens, one important thing to understand is that when it started in 2010, there was one color party in the town council. Later has been another one. One year ago, a new one came. But all of us, we have followed with this. And all of us, we are together in this. And I think that this, even if they see us because I came as political representative, even if they see us fighting for many things, they can see us together in this. And I think that this transmits a very strong message of the importance and the need that we have of a sustainable tuna fishing uh, industry <coughs> that merges the canning industry, the fishing industry, and why not the scientific and the, and the policy makers and the, and the institution. And this is uh, our target, and this is, and, uh, is where, where we are working. Don't mess with the tuna. That's the message. Don't mess with the tuna. But very interesting. And uh, sorry, uh, Mr. On your on your on your experience, is it uh, starting to pay off in terms of people uh, responding to create this conscious about the uh, about tuna as a resource for the future of, of the territory? It's, you start to yeah. feel that people I mean, are, are feeling of the uh, ownership there. I mean, I think that what people have very clear mm -hmm. is that we must keep the resource. Yes. And as uh, Julio said, is that the part of the social, the salaries, the employees, why? Because maybe uh, some countries that are involved in industry are young, but in Europe we are becoming old. And it's not easy to attract the younger people to this industry. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we have that, of course, Nowadays, we can say that the part of the resource has improved a lot in the last 20 years. 93% uh, of the catches, 86% of the stocks are within maximum sustainable yield. Looks quite a, a good figure. 
but now what we must make is that this industry is attractive for the younger people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this there comes the social mm -hmm. sustainability part. Once we have ensured minimum that we are going to have a resource, because without resource, the rest will not come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a certain challenge also for industry, right? To create the right incentives to people. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to citizens that are not necessarily employed, but they are, you know, say involved, or they know that tuna is the resource that but they resource the future for, you know, for the because to connect it with tuna industry, the restaurants, of course, uh, and as you mentioned, art, festivals, mm -hmm. international. Mm -hmm. I mean, a whole culture. Yes, that's I mean, don't forget that. I mean, no, sorry. I mean, we have also uh, a professional school. Yeah. Let's say that uh, a part of uh, what could be uh, the, 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 the standard uh, high school or a small, we have also a professional school yeah. where we have many students mm -hmm. that they, get, they take the capacity to, to work there. And people can see that uh, we are giving <coughs> options and opportunities the younger people in the town yeah. mm, to, to, to make a life in this industry. And we don't have any other option. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rest will be a university that all, all that is closed, mm -hmm. you must go outside. Yeah. The only thing that we can say that it's uh, inside, I think, is this. Yeah. Okay. That's very, very interesting. Yeah, well, it's pretty clear that, you know, that the, the, the institutions are taking good care okay, of uh, of a, of a territory connected to this strategic resource, and that's that's a, that's key. That's key. The institutions are involved, industry is involved, uh, companies are involved. This, uh, Nacio and Julio mentioned at the beginning, this is a global alliance okay, of yeah. cities. Tuna is a global resource and connect, helps to connect uh, many cities around the world. We have a shared challenge to the planet. Uh, tuna is one of the key resources of is uh, at risk, right? To be, uh, but this helps to also uh, connect the challenges globally as well. We have a global agenda, this frame that we mentioned before, the 2030 agenda, and the potential, the scalability of collaboration among cities is huge, this exponential, right? So the capacity to connect uh, cities that have these same challenges, short challenges, is one of the main values of this global alliance. We have cities that have signed up. Uh, in Bermeo, at the Tuna Forum last year, uh, we had plenty of them. You mentioned Concarneau from France, uh, Pago Pago from Samoa, American Samoa, uh, Puerto Victoria, she sells, uh, Colón Santos from Philippines. Uh, we also have um, others. <laughs> Apart from Manta, that was the last. Well, yeah, it, it, well, many of them, and all, all, all around the world. And one of them of, of, the, of the cities that were engaged personally there in, in Bermeo was Manta, specifically from Ecuador, which is the new representative that helps me to introduce uh, Guillermo, Guillermo Moran, right? Um, Guillermo, uh, well, they have a translator. Yes. For, again, for the sake of, uh, of uh, recording, we'll keep it in English, if you have a translator there. Uh, Guillermo is uh, director of the uh, of foundation Tuna Cons, which is conformed by eight um, tuna companies, uh, tuna industry companies, um, settled in Manta and Pozorja. Guillermo is uh, engineer, fishing engineer, has, is, has been vice minister of aquaculture and fishing in his country, in Ecuador. I'm president of the Inter-American Commission of, of Tropical Tuna, uh, through Tuna Cons since, uh, since, since the last seven years, impulsing and pursuing actions uh, with the objective of, of uh, achieving a sustainable fishing. He's also uh, responsible of embedding the, the standard of uh, MSC Marine Steward Council standard, which Ignacio was mentioning. And his experience, he has a broad experience in the area of management and development of sustainability processes uh, upon uh, fisheries. He's a, mentioned he's director of Tuna Cons Foundation, um, made up for eight industrial tuna companies. I was this is the translation in English. I was translating on the, on the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Guillermo is as well has a second hat. He's also representing the, the city of Manta, Ecuador. Okay. 
And on that nature, I'm gonna ask him the same uh, question that, that I asked Sigor from Bermeo. Uh, Guillermo, uh, when it comes to engaging, uh, very welcome, when it comes to engaging people, citizens, and creating, building a culture, a city culture, and ownership upon this resource, what uh, your experience has been more impactful? What has been your, your, your take on this? How are people responding? to their future connected to the sustainable management of tuna. Uh, very welcome, and, and the floor is yours. Hola, ¿cómo están? Hello, how are you? Can you listen to me? Fine, perfect. Un gusto saludarlos desde Manta, Ecuador. Okay, greeting from Manta, Ecuador. For us. It is definitely a pleasure to be able to participate at this forum of Romeo to the world. And from Manta, the city, well, this is a very important city in the EPO region, and the experience that we have had in the development of the tuna industry in Manta has been wonderful with many good results. But then, <laughs> 70 years ago, fisher, tuna fishing started here in Manta. Manta is a fishing city, most definitely, and it has implemented little by little a process of putting together the tuna value chain, and now it is our first part of the EPO. We haven't done this on our own. We've had investment from the U.S., the same, many companies in Spain, people from Bermeo actually have come to Ecuador around the 60s, 70s, and they have helped us develop this industry in the country, and of course, this chain began with Fishers. We always need to recognize that the fishing chain began with the fisher, the captain, the crew captain that needs to leave for several years in their professional life to actually go out and catch tuna. And from that effort that our fishers are making all around the world and here in Manta specifically, we have a full virtuous chain which is related to the tuna industry processing plants that nowadays are more than 20 processing plants actually in my band we store how most of them here in Manta, course technologies, universities, and little by little you start integrating the full production stage, production as such and processing and commercialization as we say here in Ecuador over the first 50 years. And then little by little, it became a part of the academia university population in Manta and Manabi, which is the province, and they are very proud of the fishing tuna industry. And whenever we talk about tuna in Ecuador, our government makes a wrong decision, of course, there is full opposition at a citizen's level, not from the guilds, not from the fishers or the companies, but they oppose as a city, as citizens, and from there you can see the tuna development and how this has been integrated from a cultural and economic point of view to the city and the province, but here, mainly the city, because they have taken on the fact that this uh, company, this industry, is what actually has made this city grow, and uh, this is a beautiful city. Uh, Julio has always been coming here in Ecuador. He's a good friend of our house, but anyway, this value chain has generated this full environment around the tuna chain, the fleet, the processing plants, labor, female labor at the processing plants is very important, and it is to what the point that besides being the cat capital of tuna, nowadays the fishing authority, the national fishing authority, is located in Manta. The Undersecretariat of Fishing Resources is located here in Manta. The Vice Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries is here in Manta as well. And so this has been the main magnet for Manta to become the capital for production, commercialization, and government decision as well. And along the last years, more than 20 years, actually, we've been talking a lot about fishery sustainability and from the creation of the sustainability standards by the MSC. This is a very important process that the Ecuadorian industry, together with other fleets from other countries, 
We have seen that it was necessary to start and implement this standard because, yes, sustainability was always in the mind of fishers in the practices of captain because one of the first actions that you take whenever you start in this Pinacon project, and I'm talking about 2015, 2016, when we were first starting, we were talking with the fishers and they were saying, yes, I do work on sustainable fishing because I take tur sea turtles back to the sea alive. We release sharks that do not pollute the sea. And we have a full internal relations within the vessel to generate the least possible impact. But fishers were saying, no one cares about it because we're doing this, but no one is talking about what fishers are also doing for sustainability before these standards get here, even because they never have actually been a very important after at the IATD, this full effort and take it into one single path because probably what was happening before it was that scientists would take one path, government another one, and the academia another one, and they wouldn't come together through sustainability. But we have been able to do this one step at a time in our territory, and now Manta promotes sustainability in Tina's fisheries, and this is a city that is a reference. In the IATTC, they work together with OPAGAG and other private organizations that are, are allies, of course, in this path. And so, of course, the city of Manta acknowledges that sustainability as an important factor to have a highly competitive edge. Thank you, Guillermo. It's been an well, uh, excellent reflection on this and very helpful. It's pretty clear that it, it's, a, it's a matter of governance, right? The, uh, the resource itself. It's a perfect, perfect uh, asset to build a whole governance for the territory. Uh, thank you. And now we will pass it to Ignacio. Yeah. We will be looking into the business dimension uh, to your experience, Ignacio. Um, what is the real value of integrating a sustainable management all throughout the value chain of a, of a business model like yours, like your experience in, in Yes, I try to explain before a little, just for, for us, a little in medium canary in base in Bermeo, we must be focused in quality, we must be focused in sustainability, we must be focused in economy. And we are we are fighting fighting uh, against the big monster of canaries and we must we must take care of the of the fish. We, uh, we will work with all round fish in our canary and it's very important to uh, uh, sentir uh, el pescado no? and querer, love the, the fish who is in, in our cuisine and to love the fish, to love the sustainability and for us it's very important that we, we, we bet for the sustainability we, we, are, we are increasing new customers that we are building a, a big relationship. We are changing from a normal tuna to MSO tuna <coughs> in scale, in scale and all this is important for us. So it's just a big generation. Yeah. Without that, it pays off. Is, it pays off in terms of sustainability, is very interesting to me. And what we are seeing over time that more and more, you know, the yeah. sector is, you know, really looking to MSP uh, resources. Yes. Uh, clients, Building on 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 Ignacio uh, with the you know, personal experience of you know managing directly you know, with a leader company, canary company, fully at the industrial level, uh, which are being the transformations when it comes to sustainable management of a, of a business model, which are the, the key stakeholders that are likely to be. Well, the um, the um, the challenges that the the, the, the tuna fleet is facing uh, are are. Um, Particularly on the on the governance in the ocean governance, because uh, uh, we share the resource with many other fishermen, right? So, as I mentioned before, we have a, a production of four or five million tons of over five million tons of tunas in the different uh, oceans. Um, we share that resource with other fleets that are competing. Uh, in the same market because the EU market is, is the privileged market where everybody wants to sell, it's the best price market. 
and the EU has a market uh, open for most of the production. So it's duty free for the round tuna, so for back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So we have to, we have the challenge. And when the people is asking us why uh, is the EU fleet or the Spanish fleet so big and, and, and is fishing all around the world? And I always say, well, listen, in Spain, uh, back in the, in the, in the 50s, it started to develop a tiny industry. Mm -hmm. And people love tuna, and they eat a lot of sardines, anchovies, tuna, and a lot of fish. Mm -hmm. uh, Spain is a fish-eating country, mm -hmm. and that's why there has been a lot of demand and uh, generated a lot of canning processing uh, in, in there that need to have a raw fish. Mm -hmm. So that's why the investment has been developing up to the level where we are now. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the sample of, of on, 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 on uh, the male world tuna capital is integrating all those those partners that are been working for, for ages. And um, now what we what we face is just to have a, a level playing field. You see, because um, if you can have a, a very good standard, uh, you can be a, a just environmentally sustainable, you can have a social standard, sustainable, a social sustainability is, is in the core of our, of, our, of our industry. But then it comes to economic viability. Not the good sustainability, viability. Mm -hmm. and, and I mentioned that because we are facing um, uh, unfair competition for all the fleet. Mm -hmm. uh, lower standard, they don't follow the rules, and they don't comply with the resolutions for environmental sustainability applied and agreed in the different management organizations. So you have to face IUU fishing, illegal fishing. You have to face forced labor uh, on board on many, uh, many fleets. There are fleets that operate in, in, and they don't change crew for over three years. Uh, they make a cheap transshipment. They don't have the shoulder coverage. You don't know where they're fishing because they switch off the, the DMS or they fish legally. They don't report, so that's a big challenge. Uh, because if we do the things right, and we all could do, be doing the same stuff, mm -hmm. that would be no problem. It would be a, a, a fair competition. So it depends on your capacity of how to fish, sell the fish, how to fish quality for quality fish. But then it comes when you have the fleet that uh, Guillermo knows very well. We are, we are fighting in the different narrow nose how to address those that are fishing out of the world. And uh, to have a fair competition, that's crucial. It has been estimated that around 12% of the catches are coming from illegal uh, fishing. And this is a big challenge because that drives the price down. Mm -hmm. you know? And the, the pity is that in the EU, in the EU mainly, there, there are a lot of uh, loopholes on the market because you know, uh, countries like Spain or uh, or, um, or, uh, or France, they have a very good control system for the import situation. But then you have a lot of member states that they don't have inspection. Mm -hmm. So they, they, there's where those fish with uncertain uh, origin are coming in, into the market, and they compete with you. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have a, a can of, of tuna so cheap in the supermarket. Mm -hmm because uh, it comes for a very cheap uh, cost, and that competes directly with our food. So how do we have to find the differentiation? Mm -hmm. It's just to put value in our, market, in our, in our product, so making, uh, to the learn, make the public know that they're fishing something that is caught legal, legally, they have sustainable uh, certification on environmental certification on the MC social conditions about the ILO that I mentioned before, or in our case, the Tuna for Responsible Fisheries Certification. And that um, gives the, the consumer the capacity to choose one thing or the other. Because I'm not against the cheap fish, no, not at all. Especially in this environment, in this context yeah. where you have uh, economic crisis or, or high inflation yeah. and all that, so okay. But there's a lot of people that is concerned about the sailing for the, for, the, for the ocean and would like to buy better the fish from Ignacio than from uh, a different uh, Asian partner that is selling in the supermarket here in Carrefour or in other 
big uh, retailers uh, that uh, they sell it very cheap. With, and you know where the fish is coming from. And this, is a, this is a problem. And these are the challenges that we are facing now. Uh, fighting the IU fishing and then making the difference market for the, for the consumer to be, to be able to fish. Yeah, yeah. so it's pretty clear that you, you have the challenge for all the stakeholders. Yeah, yeah. Only yeah. The exactly. ones. So exactly. Consumers, we have again institutions and creating the, the culture of taking care of the resource, of the consumption, the investment, mm -hmm. the way that Ignacio was mentioning, love the way that you produce, exactly. that's the way that you give in the value chain. Yes, and, and we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're having, you know, uh, we're coming to this collaborative fashion, right? Mm -hmm. Where institutions come together with the industry, with citizens, with civil society. As a matter of fact, the, this tuna sector is one of the uh, of, um, economic sectors of the fishery where a uh, very sound collaboration partnership initiative has been able to take a step forward where there was not a global legislation of the resort, which is already complex. The sector itself, industry, two smugglers, institutions, civil society, big Oxfam International, WWF, United Nations, to agree to take step forward, take action, and level the ground for the standard. That's an interesting potential of collaboration. Uh, on your understanding and on your experience uh, from the um, uh, government side, what will be the expectation of a powerful uh, public private partnership as you to tackle these, these challenges when you when you have different potential uh, to invest because to use uh, resources, data, technologies. Okay, to the power. I think that uh, in this case, one, I mean, because one good asset could be the digitalization. Okay, why? Because it could increase uh, the information that we can have regarding all these fisheries. All this digitalization could help uh, to tackle a little the, the, the illegal and the, also the, the fish. And why not also the, the conditions on board? And also regarding the, the, the information that could get from the, because uh, another thing that maybe has not yet reached the, the tuna fishing industry, which is already in the American fleet, and probably will sooner or later arrive, could be also the carbon footprint. Okay, and digitalization could be a very good option to, 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 to reduce this also carbon footprint. I mean, we have participated in pro in projects where uh, the academia, mm -hmm. the research institute, and the industry have taken part all together. And when I talk industry, I talk the fishing industry and the auxiliary industry mm -hmm. also that is supplying the, the, the systems to, to them. And in, in a digitalization pro, uh, pro, that, uh, project in the, funded by the EU that uh, with collaborative fishing, with simulation, can be possible to, to reduce up to 20% the, 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 the energy consumption. Uh, this digitalization, I mean, we must understand in a wide aspect because, uh, as uh, Julio said, uh, the life expectancy of a tuna ship for 40 years easily. 50 maybe is very old, but 40 a minimum. So maybe other technological solutions are more complicated to implement because I mean you have space constraints. Uh, and digitalization could help a lot. And here, for example, uh, in a for the future also some constraints that uh, you see it regarding the institutions, uh, especially the EU vessels have an important constraint in the time of being built that are the GTs, the size of the vessel that it's limited by, by law, and this is probably limiting the, the possibilities of making new designs of vessels where conditions for the crew also can be improved. Why? Because the size of the vessel is limited. Mm -hmm. And if we go to new fuels that will be the future, we are going to need double the tanks of fuel. Mm -hmm. So basically, if the politics of the politicians, we are just in a small level. In a higher level, don't change the rules. Basically, it's not going to be technically feasible to adapt to new fuels uh, with and reduce the carbon footprint. Yeah. So it's take step, uh, uh, steps from. The okay, this will be something that I mean must be, and I know that, uh, for example, last the research institute yeah. is working hard on it, uh, using a strong technical justification regarding uh, the design. Yeah. Because at, at the moment we already have another means 
to control the, the, the taxes. But uh, according to the EU rules, they are still controlled by the dimensions of the desk. That has no sense. Digital digitalization could help a lot yeah, tackling this limitation because there are other ways to control what the fees, what the resources are. That's an excellent example of the power of also collaboration, yeah. right? Academy yeah. with institutions, with industry, and and what and the scale of, of the the of the advantage of collaboration upon a global alliance in a universe is yeah. exponential. So uh, my wish is the third the mayor to Napoli. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very concrete one, and uh, seeing the, the impact of the second is going to be lovely. Uh, <laughs> An impact, no doubt. Diego. For me, it's to have a tuna interpretation center in, in Bermeo, a building that can merge all these uh, partners that uh, we are here in one place and give more strength to, to this Bermeo tuna world after action. Physical place yeah. where we can touch it. Where well, we can organize the next government of the world. Exactly, that comes all together. Julio. Uh, to increase uh, stakeholders participating in, in, in this organization uh, around the world. Yeah. Uh, we have a great uh, uh, help uh, and, and, and uh, example of, uh, of Manta. Mm -hmm. There are other, other partners, in, in, as you mentioned before, in different countries, but just to strengthen that with more partners from all the uh, sectors that are affected uh, by the, the, the tuna. Mm -hmm. It's not only about uh, fishing, the processing, all the similar uh, companies, the insurance, the banks, uh, the many partners that you cannot imagine that are affected by tuna, but they should be contributing to the, to the organization. Integrated, yeah. Uh, well enough, the, yeah. the alliance. Guillermo, your turn. One wish. Well, I will come together with putting together that interpretation center and adding a little bit to keep having an interpretation <coughs> and thinking center on how to promote sustainable development of tuna fisheries all over the Pacific, all over the oceans actually worldwide, because the effort that we are making as individual organizations or individual governments need to be shown through this center where we can properly think about new strategies or actions to implement joint efforts so that we can actually get what we all want, sustainable long-term fisheries that will be there for fish, for consumers, and the social and economic development of our cities and companies. So an interpretation and thought thinking center for tuna. I believe this would be very important. That would be great. No doubt, yeah. thank you very much. Mine would be to bring together all the cities that have signed up the alliance, brought it up, of course, and start sharing technologies, experiences, solutions, visions for you know a global tuna resource sustainable in the very near future. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you all here. Que hay siete ciudades que hoy han firmado. Muchas gracias a Guillermo por estar, muchas gracias a Javier, a Julio, a Sigor, a Leire y a Merichel, que está por aquí, que son los que han, que han conseguido que esto funcione bien, a pesar de las incertidumbres. Dar las gracias a, a Echevasta, a la Crana, que son los que nos invitan a tomar un espléndido aperitivo, que siempre nos hacen unos productos maravillosos. Y que, que sepáis ¿no? que existe Permeo Tuna World Capital, que hay unos locos vascos que salieron a pescar, ahora los, los que seguimos, que queremos que exista la sostenibilidad del atún, que existe la Declaración Universal, y podéis mirar en nuestra página web para interesaros un poquito más, que queremos que se haga, es una declaración internacional, que queremos que llegue a Universal. Queremos a, que sepáis que esa alianza existe y que vamos a trabajar y necesitamos más ciudades del atún que se se agreguen. Necesitamos más socios para ver menos de una World Capital, más instituciones, más empresas, más todo de la cadena de valor que quieran apoyar a este, a este proyecto. Y, que, y una frase que, que dijo alguien en un innovatón, yo creo que fue, cada vez que hacemos una compra, hacemos un acto moral, tenemos que saber qué es lo que hacemos. Eso, como ha dicho Julio, y yo soy 
eh, muy sensible a eso. Hoy estamos en una crisis y no todo el mundo, pero que sepamos que estamos haciendo nuestro acto moral. Si yo tengo un euro, los guipuzcoanos somos muy así, y los vascos, cuando tengo un euro me gasto un euro, pero si tengo tres a lo mejor puedo decidir. Entonces, bueno, eh, eh, nada más, eh, agradecer a todos eh, y que disfrutéis y, y tenéis allí a Alex y a Indica que nos han preparado un super aperitivo. Eh, no sé si te, te, te he quitado la palabra, pero... Javier, no, 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 no